What's up everyone? I am the Kaishin Okami. Hey, welcome Mirror Self. How are you doing? I am good. Thank you for asking. How are you doing? I'm fine. Yourself? The same I was a moment ago when you just asked? Awkward. Anyway, what are we doing today? I am taking a look at Shop Factory's Blu-ray release of Kamen Rider Ryuki. And the series, of course, since I have not reviewed it yet. Oh, that is awesome. I love Kamen Rider Riki. This Blu-ray release is amazing. I know. That's why I'm reviewing it. Well, and because I need to review Ryuki. Cool. Can we just get on with the review already? Because you're kind of boring me, man. Sure. Kamen Rider Ryuki holds massive significance to me. Not only was it the first Kamen Rider series I had ever watched, it was also one that showed me Toku was much more than just Japanese Power Rangers. I can never forget the sheer shock I felt by its opening scene, as we have this realistic looking city appearing before the camera focuses on some random businesswoman. It follows her home, and from there, we get some truly mind-blowing creepy music as this woman finds a spider web around her neck in the mirror. She is pulled into the mirror and we hear the sounds of her being devoured. Initially, I figured this was going to be your typical bait and switch and she would be rescued by the end of the episode. But nope! It turned out the monsters of the show do indeed eat their victims, and while we don't physically see it happen on screen, the fact that they left it to our imagination harkened back to the horror movies of old. From that moment on, I was enamored by this series as it set a bar for what I expect out of a Kamen Rider series from a maturity point of view. While I can't say Ryuki breaks my top 5 Kamen Rider shows, as there are better series out there, there is no denying the impact it had on me as someone who was really taking an interest into the realm of Toku. And unlike Gal Ranger, my first Sentai series, I feel like Ryuki still holds out to this day despite its flaws. Sadly, the production of the show does not seem to be nearly as interesting as my experience with it. Nevertheless, Ryuki also set a precedent that is still used in the franchise today. After the cop dramas that were Kuga and Agito, Toei handed the reins of Kamen Rider to the woman who gave us the exceptional Time Ranger and Ginga Man. Together with Toshiki Inoue, who served as Ryuki's secondary writer, Yasuko Kobayashi created a show that was quite different from its predecessors, pitting the Kamen Riders against each other rather than having them all work together. The premise was that there were 13 writers in the world who had to battle each other to the death and that there could only be one. Many people have compared this storyline to the Highlander franchise. Whether or not it did influence Kobayashi in any way is unknown. If you are unfamiliar with the Highlander, it was a series of films and a TV show about people who cannot die unless their head is cut off and the last one remaining would be given whatever it is their heart desires. Kamen Rider Ryuki followed this concept with the battle royal styled story and the outcome being that the last survivor would be rewarded in the same manner as those in the Highlander. The concept was ingenious and set itself apart from what anyone could expect from a toku series at the time. The question is, did it work? Or is Kamen Rider Ryuki all style and no substance? Let's find out. The Kamen Riders. Given the nature of how this show plays out, I figured it was probably best to just list off the Kamen Riders, good or bad, and talk about the side characters that go with those riders. Our lead rider is Takamasa Suga's Shinji Kido. Shinji is a lovable goofball who always tries to see the good in everyone regardless of the situation he is put into. <laughs> He becomes an unwilling participant in Shiro Kanzaki's Rider game, which pits every Kamen Rider against each other under the promise that the sole survivor will be given whatever it is they desire. Shinji hates this ideology and believes that the Riders should be fighting to protect mankind against the monsters that come from the world of mirrors as opposed to each other. <laughs> 
バカだと思う人手上げはい。Then there is Nanako Shimada, Ori's technical wizard and website designer. She appears to have a crush on Shinji, though her motivations are really unknown. What we do know for sure is that she seems to be a little too connected to computers, as seen here. <laughs> Kamen Rider 5's fans should recognize Shimada as actress Hitomi Kirahara was also smart lady there. Kanji Suda is Daisuke, who has appeared in several other projects including Garo the One Who Shines in Darkness, Shin Godzilla, and Gamera the Brave. Sayaka Kuan portrays Reiko, who had a very brief appearance in Godzilla against Mecha Godzilla. I don't know if you're a kid. I'm not sure if you're a kid. I'm not sure if you're a kid. The Ore cast is an interesting lot, especially as they start to uncover the mysteries of the Mirror World and Shiro Kanzaki, only for it to essentially go nowhere. Takami Shiro, Nihonja Kanzaki Shiro. If you're a kid, you're a kid. 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 Back to Shinji, he gets thrust into the Rider War by accident after finding a blank contract card that leads him to being hounded by a red dragon monster until he forms a bond with the creature to become Kamen Rider Ryuki. Henshin! It is revealed through him that the riders use a card system to give them their weapons and abilities that is typically a piece of their contracted monster. Often, Shinji will use its tail as a sword. <laughs> while parts of its body become shields. <laughs> To initiate a final attack, like a rider kick, the final vent card is used which sees the rider and monster tag teaming their opponent for a climactic strike. Our second rider is Ren Akiyama, also known as Kamen Rider Knight. Henshin! I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. Mas bai kara oriru ya. At the beginning of the series, Ren can't stand the sight of Shinji and tries to get rid of him immediately, finding himself unable to do so. We come to learn that Ren's girlfriend was put into a coma during one of Shiro Kanzaki's Mirror World experiments, and to save her, he has to win it. Ren was. 
was a bad boy before he met Iri, and believes her to be the sole purpose for his existence. And Satoshi Matsuda plays this extremely well. <laughs> Even so, Ren finds it harder to outright murder someone just for her, knowing that she would not approve of his actions. Ren attracts trouble like Kiru does to side missions in the Yakuza franchise. There is one episode where Ren is hit with amnesia and everywhere he walks, someone he picked a fight with in the past emerges out of nowhere. At some point before the series start, Ren made friends with Shiro's sister Yui, and together with Shinji, they become somewhat of a protector for her while they all try to uncover what Shiro's true motivations are. Yui was separated from her brother when they were young due to their parents dying. Learning her brother is the one responsible for the Rider battle sets her off on a quest for answers. What is revealed as we progress through the tale of Ryuki is a spiral staircase of suspense. The outcome is unexpected. <laughs> Shinji and Ren even end up moving into Yui's house after her grandmother returns from an exotic trip, with the caveat that they must help out with the cafe business from time to time. Behind Ren's bad boy persona is a caring individual who hates the position he has been put into, his biggest flaw is being uncomfortable showing these emotions. He and Shinji also share the notion of being afraid of dogs. Both Shinji and Ren do get upgrade forms over the course of the show that are deemed survive modes. In addition to their costumes changing, their contract monsters morph as well and can even transform into a motorcycle mode. Beats the generic bike action that is pretty much just a bike that transports the rider from the real world to the mirror world. Even though everyone else seems to get pulled in right away. The next major player is a lawyer who's dying from cancer and his only way out is to win the rider fight as Kamen Rider Zoda. <laughs> Shuichi Kitaoka, played by Ryohei Odai, will defend anyone that can pay him, utilizing underhanded tactics to win a case if it will make him look good in the spotlight. He's an arrogant asshole, though he does have some charming pieces to his personality. Kitaoka initially finds Shinji to be an intriguing fellow, only to grow bored with him over time and tries his best to knock him out of their conflict upon learning he is Ryuki. He even goes as far as to use his secretary, Goro Yura, in his schemes against Shinji if it will work out in his favor, as was the case when he tricked Shinji into believing Goro was Zoda and he had accidentally killed the man. goro Goro-chan? Shinda. Kitaoka ends up falling in love with Reiko because she will not submit to his bullshit, which becomes a constant key point in his growing as a character. Well, he is considered to be his secretary, Goro is more like a bodyguard. It is hinted that he was once a gangster Kitaoka saved from prison or something. <laughs> In the second half of the series, it is revealed that Goro was not his first protector, as that job went to the martial artist Nincompoop Megumi Asano.
Megumi always made mistakes. And despite her ability to kick ass, Kitaoka could no longer handle the number of times she accidentally injured him and fired her. Special spaghetti できました! She does end up getting a job with Ore, which frustrates Shimano to no end as she can't stand Megumi's bubbly personality. I should also mention that Megumi's actress, Tomohisa Yuge, played Samus in the Metroid Zero Mission Game Boy Advance commercial. Yes, that one. And if you didn't know, Goro is played by Tomohisa Yuge, who was also in Kabuto and Shibuya 15. The final major player is the serial killer Takeshi Asakura. Early on in his life, Asakura realized his path in life was psycho and traversed it by burning down his house, killing his parents in the process. We first meet Asakura in prison, learning that Kitaoka is his lawyer and that he hates the man to death. This act of hate encourages Shiro to turn Asakura into the Cobra-themed Kamen Rider Oja, under the pretense that he needs to get the Rider battle rolling since Shinji's actions have caused it to stall. Asakura's first act out of prison is to take a restaurant hostage, holding a young girl at gunpoint, and demand his lawyer's presence. <laughs> It's quite incredible how this dude holds nothing back and ends up becoming one of the franchise's greatest villains. What's even more mind-blowing is thinking about Takashi Hagino, who went from playing a lead hero in Chainsaw to a Sakura, and how both performances are completely different from each other, as if they were two different people portraying the characters. You know you're a remarkable actor when you can play both hero and villain and not appear to be the same guy. To make things even more badass for Asakura, he actually has three contract monster cards, allowing him to command three monsters at one time. As such, he utilizes these to take control of the Rhino and Manta Ray monsters from the riders he killed and is then able to combine them with a fusion card. Or polymerization if you wanted to go with the American Yu-Gi-Oh terminology. Either way, Asakura is my favorite character in the show, and I love how Shiro seems to have given him additional allowances he doesn't allow the other writers to. Oh, and for as crazy as he is, you cannot say that Asakura is not willing to share. <laughs> Between Zoda and Oja, we are introduced to a few other riders. Kamen Rider Scissors is brought in just to show us that not every rider is a good guy. There are some cool concepts to him, but given we only see him for two episodes, there's not much to go on. The next one to appear is some rich kid jackass that utilizes the alias of Kamen Rider Guy. Guy thinks he's entitled to do whatever he wants to, taking over Ori Journal at one point with a computer virus that Shimada has to conquer. He then tries to team up with Oja to his own detriment. Around the same time as Guy, we meet the clairvoyant Kamen Rider Raya, who is played by Ultraman Agul himself, Hasei Takano. ちょっと… 
I do kind of like Raya because he agrees with Shinji in trying to stop the Rider battle from happening. His lover was killed by a mirror monster for refusing to take on the mantle of Raya, so Shiro gave it to him in the hope that vengeance would be his sole motivator to kill all other participants. <laughs> After Guy and Raya are dispatched, the plot kind of slows down as far as Kamen Riders are concerned until we are introduced to Tiger and two others who transform into Alternative and Alternative Zero in the last third of the series. Hey, this trio encompassed a professor and two students at the university Shiro had been conducting experiments in. The professor, Hideyuki Kagawa, accidentally read Shiro's notes on the mirror world and with his photographic memory, was able to recreate the writer's system. Hishin. This enabled him to become a writer himself using the name Alternative Zero, while one of his pupils became Alternative. <laughs> The other student, Satoru Tojo, would be offered the Kamen Rider Tiger deck by Shiro because his dream was to become the ultimate hero. Like Takano before him, Tojo's actor, Jun Takasuki, kicked off his toku career as Ultraman Neos. <laughs> This trio's main objective was to close the mirror world, and while they do recruit Shinji to their cause, the means behind acquiring this rend their partnership asunder. Tojo is a sly little brat who makes Asakura look like a good guy because at least Asakura is honest about who he truly is. Tojo will just do whatever he thinks is right in the moment and damn anyone who disagrees with him. Throughout the series, our heroes find themselves under attack by a plethora of gazelle-type monsters. Towards the end, it is revealed that these monsters are all under the control of Kamen Rider Emperor. Emperor is revealed to be the son of a CEO, who sent him out in the real world to learn what it is like to work for a living. This causes Mitsuru Sanao to work as a brown nosing valet in a parking garage for rich people. Shiro took advantage of this notion and used it to coerce Mitsuru into becoming a rider. Mitsuru did not truly think about the consequences he would be embarking on, as was the case when his wish came true and he no longer wanted to be a rider. As if that wasn't bad enough, he also made the mistake of becoming friends with Tojo, something he ended up regretting. Takashi Hyuga effectively plays our naive rider. <laughs> Our final writer in the series is Kamen Rider Odin. Kamen Rider Odin has a motif of a phoenix and controls time. time Just who exactly is Odin, you might ask? Well, good luck figuring that out. It's never actually revealed. All we know is that he is a puppet controlled by Shiro who proclaims himself as the final boss, specifically the 13th Rider, which makes no sense. <laughs> If you've been counting the writers up to this point, there's only nine before Odin. And that may be one of the show's biggest annoyances. It constantly advertises there would be 13 writers in the series, only to cut it off at 10. And that's something the US adaptation, Kamen Rider Dragonite, did better in. It actually had all 13 writers in its series. 
They apparently wanted the show to have a new common Rider each week, totaling the count out to 50, only to learn how much it would have cost them to do such. Either Toei was too ambitious with their Rider count, or they just simply ran out of time. Whatever the reason may be, the fact that you have to fudge up an excuse for there not to be 13 Riders is a complete letdown. The Monsters. Yes, there are monsters in this show, but this will be very brief. They're usually just there as a reason for the riders to travel to the mirror world and end up fighting each other. They're not very memorable, and this seems to be the main influencer on why Monsters of the Week are an afterthought in a Kamen Rider series these days. It's kind of disappointing, albeit a revolutionary idea at the time. I will admit, when I first watched Ryuki, not having a Monster of the Week all the time was like revolutionary compared to what Super Sentai was doing. It was different. It made it stand out. If only they didn't continuously do that with many series. The effects and music. Ryuki's music is excellent. While the effects really just vary upon what camera type was being used to film what. The reason I say that is because Ryuki has an interesting case where it appears that a held hand cam of some sort was used. <laughs> While I do appreciate the effort to make battles have a raw feel to them from it, the decrease in quality from the standard cameras was quite noticeable even back when the show first came out. The CGI used for the monsters has not held up well over the years, though they are far from bad. I do feel the CGI doesn't stick out as much thanks to the story that keeps you immersed in the action to the point where you are not concerned with the negatives of the effects. Had it not been for that, I'm sure things could have been a lot worse. The scenes of the characters transporting into the mirror world do look pretty good. I also have to praise the extensive work the production team had to perform to make every piece of signage and text backwards while in the mirror world. That could not have been an easy task while filming in real world sites. There are some exquisite backgrounds used in this series, specifically for those revolving around the survive forms. My eyes can't help but fondle the orange fiery background used for Ryuki's, even though Night's Windy one is equally exhilarating. And of course, you can't forget the excellent music that enhances these sequences. Speaking of music, as with most of the common writers from the time, it is simply superb. Kazunori Maruyama is credited as being the main composer of the show, with Chiyo Watanabe doing a few other pieces. I'm not sure if there is a clear distinction between what track belongs to whom, but it really doesn't matter because there is not one piece of bad music in this show's entirety. It doesn't matter if it is various pieces from fight scenes. <laughs> A writer's own theme music. <laughs> to even little ones, such as when Reiko has confronted a Sakura. <laughs> It is all pure excellence in my book. Hey. 
Riko Matsumoto sings the opening theme, Alive Alive, which I'm sure rocked the world of Pokemon lovers considering she is the voice behind Satoshi Ash Ketchum, along with being the second voice of Ryo Bakura in Yu-Gi-Oh! Alive Alive is a damn good opening theme that I always struggle to skip past whenever I binge the show. The Episodes Ryuki is such a damn good show that the little things that harm it are painful to discuss. This is because those little annoyances do hinder the overall package. As I said earlier, the fact that there are not actually 13 riders in the series is very infuriating. Don't tell me continuously 13 riders this, 13 riders that, and then not provide 13 actual freaking riders. Other aspects do include how character shields can get a little too high from time to time, Asakura being given the ability to do whatever the heck he wants is cool from a fan perspective, but then to have him come out of things like a car bomb unscathed is a bit much. <clears throat> I hate to say it, that one moment should have probably been his end, as unsatisfying as it would have been. Or if he did survive, he should have been burned quite badly. It got better. Then there is the moment when Shimada came into contact with the mirror monster and nothing happened. Like, okay, the mirror monsters have taken any and every victim they have set their sights on, even if a rider appeared to stop them. In this one instant though, the mirror monster chooses not to go after his victim even though no one is around to save her. That feels a bit weird. Another issue with Ryuki is sometimes it can get a little too mixed up with its comedy, as was the case with episode 29, Mirage Interview Battle. Reiko feels like she is being stalked by someone and goes missing. Reiko-san! Reiko-san! This same thing happens to Shimada. This leads to some silly antics between Yui, Ren, Kita, Oka, and Shinji where they go undercover to find the missing duo. Yui pretends to be a possible bride to one weird dude who everyone thinks is the kidnapper and she searches his home to some outrageous stunts. Okay, I don't care who you are, you do something like that to my collection, I will murder you. Still, there's just way too many silly hijinks in this episode with a really dumb resolution that makes little sense. On the other hand, getting away from the silliness, I do like how the series will show the horrors of battle. We have an episode where a kid sees Ren transform and wants him to let him be a superhero. Ren goes into the next fight while Shinji allows the kid to see the entire brawl by holding onto his card deck. <laughs> Congratulations! You have won a lifetime supply of therapy! Even Goro was privy to this, finally getting to see his master in action. <laughs> Naturally, my favorite episodes of the series is the two-parter that brings the Sakura into the fray. 18 and 19, Jailbreak Rider and Rider Gathering. I don't think I really need to explain any more beyond what it was like to first see a show that had no qualms about making a serial killer into a titular character and not holding back. From good music... <laughs> Awesome fight scenes. <laughs> with a shocker of an ending, you just can't go wrong with this lot. The movie and specials. Kamen Rider Ryuki makes me pine for the days when Kamen Rider series had minimal additional content. Before I get into the contents themselves, I do have to say that my frustration when it comes to there not being 13 riders dives even into the movie and special. For some reason, Tully felt the need to make out the 11th, 12th, and 13th riders exclusive to this content. 
Again, I'm not sure if this was due to time restraints or if they thought they were doing something revolutionary, but it didn't work within the confines of the show. Most fans have theorized that the events of the special movie are alternate timelines that occurred, but were reset when things didn't go as Shiro had planned. After all, Odin can reset time, and we've seen it utilized in a very ingenious clip show episode of the series. Nevertheless, it still doesn't make it any less annoying. Anyway, the summer movie was titled Episode Final and features a time when only six writers remain. Ryuki Knight, Zoda, Oja, and two new faces, Famine Ryuga. Hey, is a con artist named Miho Kirishima, who is out for revenge as a Sakura murdered her sister and she had her put into cryostasis in the hopes that she can be resurrected one day. <laughs> Huh? Wait. So her sister was murdered, but she was put in ice to possibly be resurrected later? So that means she wasn't murdered because she'd have to be alive to be brought back. I'm sorry. That that doesn't make any sense. Huh? Is she dead or is she not dead? Miho ends up legitimately falling in love with Shinji and spends a lot of the movie's runtime with him. Ryuga is just an evil mirror version of Shinji because of course he is. Having it any other way would require giving another character development and we can't have that. Even with its flaws, Episode Final remains one of my favorite Kamen Rider movies as there is a lot I love about it, from its production values to its fight and that freaking badass soundtrack. Specifically in this fight. <laughs> What was that? That was heaven. The purest, most vibrant, most perfect harmony I've ever heard. Next up was a nice Ryuki vs. Agito DVD short. It features a Sakura, Ren and Kitaoka taking orders from Shinji. On top of teaming up with Agito to fight an evil Agito. From there we have the 13 Riders television special that allowed viewers to vote for their ending of choice in the same manner DC allowed fans to vote for the fate of Jason Todd. It has Shinji meeting the man who was supposed to be Ryuki originally, aptly played by Ryu Ranger's Kiichi Wada. <laughs> Shinji is given a list of the writers and immediately goes to try and stop the war, meeting the chameleon-based writer Verde, who is a rich businessman that wants to win the writer war just because he can. <laughs> He's an unlikable jackass and is what causes the rest of the writers to revolt against Shinji's intentions. We also get to see Asakura perform his best Hannibal impersonation. Hello, Clarice. Dr. Lecter, my name is Clarice Starling. May I speak with you? You're one of Jack Crawford's, aren't you? Overall, this special kind of sucks big time and neither ending is great, though the ending that audiences did not vote for is the better of the two. At least that ending had some sort of closure compared to the craptastic one they did. <laughs> That was pretty much it for Ryuki until Kamen Rider Geo came out in 2018. During Geo's uh, what the hell is that? Is that seriously one of Geo's costumes from that show? Good God, that thing is garish. 
What were they thinking? Oh, and I thought some of the previous Kamen Rider costumes that were used in series were bad, but wow. So anyway, back to what I was saying. During Geo's run, Toei had anyway write a three-part special called Rider Time that brought back several of the actors from the show and featured them waking up in the mirror world, having to battle each other yet again. <laughs> It's not a bad special, though the ending kind of ruined it. We get some outstanding camera work. The shark rider from Decade makes an appearance over Femme for some reason. And the special finally does something somewhat interesting with Ryuga. It does have a lot of interesting ideas. I just wish they were implemented better. It also gets a little Game of Thrones up in there. The Blu-ray. Shout Factory has provided us with a solid Kamen Rider Blu-ray release. Here's the cover, the spine, the backside. Now on the interior, it's interesting because we have episode titles, even though the episodes themselves just give a number. We've got discs in trays, and the movie episode final on the last disc. It's a really solid release overall. Now I would be lying if I said the video quality is perfect as it is not. The show was filmed digitally, and suffers for such as it really could only be upscaled into high definition as opposed to getting a tried and true remastered a la a film print. Regardless, the show does look incredible even if it has the small flaws Toei's DVDs featured with the occasional rainbow and or softness to it depending on how the scene was filmed. <sighs> そうだろう。え、しん。なんだ、Audio is clear with the music leaving your ears immersed in the ecstasy that is the show's soundtrack. The subtitles use a white font for everything, dialogue, and song lyrics, which can get a little annoying because both are found towards the bottom of the screen, meaning you will occasionally mix up which line you are reading. <laughs> I wish they had placed the song lyrics at the top of the screen as Discotech had done with Kamen Rider Black. Still, the fact that the songs are fully subbed, even with the dialogue, is an improvement from what we were getting before, so I do applaud Shout Factory for this. This set does include the director's cut to episode final, which is totally awesome. If I had any nitpick, it is that the movie is in 2.0 audio as opposed to the blissful 5.1 track Toei had on their discs in Japan. The 13 Rider special and Rider time are of course not included. In the end, Ryuki is a solid entry into the Kamen Rider franchise, even if it isn't a perfect one. The ending is very frustrating, especially the lack of using 13 Riders. Nevertheless, the show truly deserves a solid 4 out of 5 grown-ups in spandex. So what do you think, Mirror World Self? Do you think this review was well worth it? Yes, I do, but I'm disappointed you only gave it a 4. I mean, this show's totally worth a 5. Hey, more power to you. I think it's a 4 because it has too many flaws to not notice. <sighs> yeah, okay, whatever, dude. Um, I'm gonna go back to Twitter where they actually know what's good there and know what ranks as a good show, so peace, y'all. Okay.
Either way, this Blu-ray is worth buying. Until next time, bye. I was today years old when I learned I had been saying this word completely wrong the entire time. Well, technically not today since it was when I first watched this episode a few weeks ago. But still, I always thought it was prerogative, not prerogative. So don't let anyone ever tell you you can't learn anything from watching subtitles. Because I am proof that is wrong. That I had been saying a word wrong my entire life until that very moment. Man, how many times in my reviews have I said that wrong? Oops. Did anyone else not know it was prerogative? Please tell me I'm not alone.